moment I learnt to read and write, um, obviously you start off drawing, then you start reading and writing, my attention became divided and um, I went through periods in my life, especially as a younger person, where I just write intensively uh, long stories but not paint and then other periods where I'd paint a lot but find it difficult to string together a narrative. So you had two settings. Yeah, and they, they kind of, they're like oil and water. They don't really ever mix properly. Even words and pictures I struggle with even now after doing so many books that are words and pictures. Um, but I kind of accept that, that they, they never actually mix, but that's what makes them quite beautiful is that, you know, oil over water can create this wonderful yeah. pattern. It doesn't dissolve, and there's always a tension between one and the other. Well, you have... <laughs> you have very big pictures and very sparse words. So this is called The Rules of Summer. And the the, the opening page, which is just... Uh, scribble. A, a scribble. <laughs> and then beautifully, in the, it's rather sparse scribble. And then in the middle of it all is the other words, this is what I learned last summer. And then every page is a series of propositions. For example, the, the, the first story is never leave a red sock on the clothesline. You know, sometimes I think it's it's better to just say less uh, because everyone's imagination is is quite interesting and quite different and I don't want to clutter it up with my own ideas. Yeah. So. Although never leave a red sock on the clothesline is also functioning as the title yes. for the picture opposite. So there are the two little boys, one a little bit like you, cowering in a very sparse back garden in which there's nothing but a rainwater tank and a very simple old-fashioned clothesline on which we realise after looking at the picture for a little while there was a single tiny, weeny little red sock. Yes. Because what we've really noticed is that over the back fence is... A gigantic red rabbit <laughs> staring at them or looking for them. With its one beady eye. Yeah. That's, a, that's an interesting example. That was almost a starting point for the whole book is the interesting tension that you get between the simple sentence, which is something fairly prosaic. Never and, leave a red sock on the clothesline. Yeah, and then this image, which is very unexpected, couldn't possibly be anticipated from reading the text, and yet they work together so well. They inform each other in a way that they couldn't they couldn't really convey those sort of feelings separately. The boys are very small, aren't they, compared to the landscape. They live in a very big world. Yes, which is, uh, I guess, how I felt when I was growing up in the northern suburbs of Perth. Uh, it was a big landscape, big sky, flat horizon, ocean on one side, awareness of an invisible desert on the other, and uh, the, the suburb was very sandy and still being developed, so... Yeah. Our idea of playing was just to run amok in the bush and uh, building sites. Um, no trees or anything, just everything sort of flat, bits of concrete and sand. And uh, I guess that sort of burnt an impression on my, my memory that won't go away. It comes up in a lot of my work. Actually, there were some places that looked a little bit like Perth or Fremantle and some places that I thought might be closer to where you live now, which is in the suburb of Melbourne, Brunswick. Is that, is that fair? Or is yeah, it that's right. Yeah. It's a strange sort of fusion. The... Um, Brunswicky elements started coming in in the process of painting, so they're not so much in the original sketches. Um, and then as I started painting these, um, you know, uh, sort of empty factories and blank brick walls and lots of wires overhead and things like that started to creep in, which is uh, a reflection of my experience just walking around the suburb over the past six or seven years. So in one picture we're looking at the kids playing an unnameable game but involves balls and cones and things and they're on something that looks a bit like a basketball court but mi mi sort of painted up in a way that's more playful than that. And in the background of this beautifully illuminated area there's a great phalanx of um, electricity pylons standing yeah. sort of sentinel in the darkness. Mm. Which are beautiful things actually when you stop looking at them in a utilitarian way. Um, I've always loved them. Um, but there's a sense of I don't know, sort of post-industrial menace about them, you know, like the, the built environment taking over the human one. They do look a little bit scary in the particular picture. Are we looking yeah, at they're here? almost like pagan figures, which, you know, when you drive past them, and, and certainly some future culture might look on them and, and think that we worship these things because we built so many of them they and they're so big. <laughs> they do look as though they've got heads at the yeah, top yeah, little, and sure. arms sticking out. To Sometimes themselves. little cat ears. A little cat ears, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's absolutely right. What's the medium... Here, what, what, what are you painting with? Uh, oil painting um, on canvas, quite large, which is unusual for me. Um, and also using a palette knife as well as a brush so that you get this very textual, scrapey sort of look. 
Yeah, it's also almost, um, I mean, the, the opening picture is of the two boys in a, in a field with some imaginary creatures and you've got yellow grass and the yellow grass is a bit like um, sort of Van Gogh wheat. Yeah, um, I guess, um, I mean, I really love texture. I, I've started working digitally a lot, obviously, on things like the Lost Thing film, which is, you know, it's a necessary part of the culture and I, I quite like digital effects. But, uh, you know, my, my background is as a painter and what I love about painting is its primitive materiality, you know, the, the fact that it's, at the end of the day, it's coloured mud dragged across cloth mm. and somehow it conjures an image. Yeah. And the image works because of that funny paradox. You, you know it's not real, but you can't help being drawn into the reality of it. But what's interesting for you is that you're not painting those pictures as a, as a final product. You're painting them because they will become the illustrations in a book. Yes. So someone else has to come along and process them in a way that results in them being printed up. So presumably there's some kind of loss of definition in there. There must be a, something frustrating about creating a textured oil painting and then seeing it flat on a shiny page. Well, there there is sometimes. There's always that problem that all illustrators face, and that's the fact that your final product is a is a printed object which is somewhat different to the the painting that you've been deluding yourself into believing will be reproduced accurately. It's a little bit like um, a novelist seeing their book published and a few adjectives have dropped out along the way. Uh, so you, you lose something, but you also gain other things such as the format and the, the physicality of the book, which is something that's not accessible when things mm. are all separate paintings. With this particular book, the, uh, the paintings weren't scanned. They were all photographed. And um, that was something that that uh, I was involved with closely just to um, work with a photographer to capture the texture. And why is that different? What's the difference? Oh, just the texture so that you actually get a directional lighting on the image and it picks up the, the shadows of the brush marks and so on. So how does this sort of book take shape? Did you, did you imagine a story and then you illustrated the various acts of the story or do you just sort of do pictures and then they kind of come together? Yeah, kind of the latter. I, I, I rarely know what I'm doing. Um, most of my work doesn't end up as anything because it, it's so fragmentary. I just think in such a fragmentary way, I find it hard to actually construct narratives. So my solution is to focus on the jigsaw puzzle pieces, just make them, and then see how they might fit together. And then, you know, cut them a little bit to make sure they join. But, uh, um, you know, for years I struggled trying to create narrative that was more cohesive and the older I get, the more I, I realise that's just not my nature. It's, it's in my nature to, to do little fragments. And will the paintings themselves be sold as objects? Is that Will there be an exhibition of these or how will that work? Um, there will be a, an exhibition of them uh, from October 24, just for a few days. And it's really uh, more a, a book launch event uh, that lingers rather than an exhibition. But I haven't actually decided what I'll do mm. with the originals. I haven't really got that far abc.net.au slash radio national